All right, welcome back to 105. Wow, that's an echo. Yikes. All right, so thank you for joining me today. Today, we get to continue our journey on, well, making our computer do something other than blindly following statement after statement. We actually taught it how to jump around a little bit. So we'll be doing more of that today and getting some more practice. So we saw a bunch of relational if statements. We saw uh, a bunch of ways to just have ands and ors and more logic statements. So we saw comparing numbers. Well, we know that characters are actually just numbers represented by the computer. You don't actually need to know which character corresponds to which number, but you should know some generally how they are ordered because you are allowed to compare characters and sometimes it will be useful. So remember, characters are ASCII encoded, so they're converted into bytes. And the way they are ordered, so the important ones are, well, all of the digits are ordered in order from, in terms of value. So zero gets the lowest actual number. Again, doesn't really matter what that number is. And then nine gets the highest of them. So if you did an inequality behind, between all of them, so the character zero is actually less than the character one. And then you don't actually need to know what the character capital A is, but you should know in terms of order, well, a capital A is greater than any digit. So that's something you should know. And then all of the capital characters are all in order. So A is less than B, B is less than C, all the way up until Z. And then after that comes all of the lowercase letters. So we have lowercase a, then is less than lowercase b, is less than lowercase c, all the way up to lowercase z. So these are fairly important numbers to know because they will be, you know, they'll be actually useful as we will see today. So like I said, we can do arithmetic just on the letters. So the digits zero through nine, they're sequential. So their values increase by one. Again, doesn't really, we don't really care what the value of zero is, but it might be nice to know that, hey, if we take the character zero, so the characters between the single quotes, we can do math on it like anything else. So it's a bit weird looking, but we can just add the integer two to it. And then that will actually result in the character two. So because, you know, one away from the character zero is the digit one, and then two away from the character zero is the digit two. And similarly, if we just take the character zero and add five to it, we get the character five. Bit weird, but these are how the rules work. So again, all of the uppercase characters, they're sequential, so their values increase by exactly one, as well as the lowercase letters A through Z. And if you want to know, well, an uppercase letter plus 32 results in a lowercase version of that character, but that's something you probably will never ever use for this course. So if there's anything to forget, you can forget about that one. But if we actually did some examples with it, well, if we took the uppercase A and then we added two, that's just two more letters in the alphabet. So A plus one would be capital B, uppercase A plus two would be uppercase C. And then if I had lowercase a plus three, well, that's lowercase d. And if I, you could also subtract if you really wanted to. So if I wanted to know the letter before O, I could just say O minus one, and then I would get N. So just fun things we can do with characters that may or may not be fun depending on who you are. So we can actually, write a program now that kind of looks for user's input and tells what the user is actually inputting. So, oh Jesus. So we can write a program that actually looks for a letter. So here we can start the program off 
Remember, if we argue about executing a program, it always starts at main. So the first thing our program would do would output enter a character. And then here we will create a character. I will very creatively name C. So I'll create a character named C and I'll initialize it. So in this case, this is a way of initializing it to a, a zero. So there is a special zero character that if you do an escape code and a zero, that means a character with a value of zero. Now I do a scan F, so I let the user input a character. Oh, yep, sorry. So, uh, that online thing, that's the same Yep, so on line six, this is actually equivalent of saying this if I really wanted to. They mean the same thing, but yeah, generally, if it's a character, characters should just be in single quotes because that's what a character is. You can play with the numbers if you want and let it kind of implicitly convert things, but you don't have to. All right, so then we do a scan F, so we let the user input a single character, and then this is going to be our job to say, hey, did you enter a letter or did you not enter a letter? So we have an if statement, so if a condition I need to write is true, I want it to print off you entered a letter, otherwise I wanted to say I didn't enter a letter, and again, this is an if else statement, so only one of these things are going to print at whenever I run my program. So right now, since I just have if one, remember that's just saying if true. So that means this code should always execute no matter what I input. So let's just make sure that that is true and I haven't taken my crazy pills today. So enter a character. I can enter something that's not a letter. So let's say seven. And now, because I wrote my program wrong, it says you have entered a letter, so that is no good. So let us start developing this relational statement we have to have in this if so that it will actually check that character and then see if it is a letter or not. So if we were to write, you know, actual English, or actual like math notation, we probably might write something like, hey, well, we want a capital A to be between C and then between Z, something like that. Turns out we can't actually write that in C because, well, if we actually thought about how C calculates this value, what it would do, remember C can only do like one operation at a time with two operands. So how it would do this is it would first, because we have less left associativity, so it would compare A to C. So in this case, if A is less than C, then this would be true. And then it would compare is true less than Z, which is probably not what you want. So we want to make sure our character in this case is between capital A and less than lowercase z. So in this case, yep, question? Sorry? The YouTube crash? The stream crashed. Uh, says it's working, so. Uh, uh, all right, well, if it crashes, I have a recording on my laptop, I'll upload it later. Yep. So in, in this case, we can use an ampersand, double ampersand, this and? Yeah, so got a comment that in this case, if I want both of those things to be true, so I want to be between a value, well, I should pretty much just translate it like exactly what I said in English. So I want to make sure the character is greater than a capital A and also less than a capital Z. So then it's between those bounds if both of those conditions are true. So in this case, I might want to check, well, if C is greater than or equal to A, so I want to include A, so this means that it is some value 
that is capital A or greater. So I also, in this case, there's some letters and other things that are after the capital Z. So I want to make sure that it is also less than or equal to the capital Z. So I should say, I also want this to be true. So now if this is my if statement, that looks a bit better now. So now this if statement is only true if the character I entered is greater than or equal to capital A and it's also less than or equal to capital Z. So now we can compile this and try it. So now if I enter just an A, well, that should be true. So that conditional statement, whenever C computes it, it's true. So I get this part of the if statement. So I get you entered a letter. And now if I enter, I don't know, say a digit, well, a digit shouldn't be within those bounds. It shouldn't be a capital letter. So if I enter again, let's say six, I see it prints off. You did not enter a letter because this is false. So right now we are close to done. Yep. Yeah, so right now the scanf only looks for a single character. So if I enter more than one character, it'll do something weird. We'll, we'll figure out how to handle that later. But now we're just always assuming whoever is typing into the keyboard is nice to us. Yep. And so one more question is that like when you said you entered a letter, like what did you mean like a capital letter only or like even a small letter? Yeah. Like yeah. So in this case, well, I'm not quite done yet because there are lowercase letters. So if I run this program and I type, I don't know, a lowercase j, it says you did not enter a letter. So I still have some work to do. So this is basically just checking if I entered a capital character. So I also want to check if I, I'm also allowed to enter a lowercase character. So in that case, you just use the or statement. Sorry? The or statement, like in, if you want to include the small a to small g. Yeah, so if I want to include lowercase characters, well, if I was, we're to say it in English, I want to be able to accept an uppercase character or a lowercase character. Either is fine. I wouldn't want an and. I don't, no character can be both an uppercase and a lowercase at the same time. That doesn't make sense. So I will have to check if it is an uppercase or a lowercase. So in this case, well, I'm not going to worry about the precedence rules. So I'm just going to throw this whole uh, logic statement all in brackets. So I just bracketed that uppercase check. And now I can write out my or and then start a new set of brackets. And then in here, I will check if it is a lowercase. So I want C to be less than or equal to lowercase a. And I also want C to be less than or equal to a lowercase z. So now if I read this out right here, this little condition will check if it is that character I entered is between capital A and capital Z. So if that's true, well, then it's an uppercase letter. And that's true if I've true or anything. It doesn't really matter what the anything is. The whole expression is true. And if it is false, well, then what's going to happen is we'll compute and see if the character is a lowercase letter. So we'll check if it is greater or equal to lowercase a. And that character is also less than lowercase z. So if we go ahead and compile and run this now, well, if I type a j, it says, hey, you entered a letter. So it seems to actually work now. And to just check that we didn't screw up anything, we can also just try you know, a capital letter again to make sure that it still works. And now, hey, it says you entered a letter. We can try a digit, and it says you did not enter a letter. So it seems to work now. 
So any questions about that? Yep. Yeah, so the question is, well, what about if I just did some check where I just checked if it was greater or equal to a uppercase A, oops, and then less than a lowercase Z. So turns out there are some values actually in between the uppercase and the lowercase letters. Uh, let's see what they are. Oh, I don't have it handy. So I believe if I do this and I entered a tilde character, I think that's between. Yeah, so tilde character is between. So now it says that's a letter. That's not a letter. Wow, I pulled that one out of my rear. Uh, all right, yeah. Yeah, so the question is when we had when we had this statement where we were warring, does the order matter? So turns out it kind of matters, which we'll get into later, but in terms of the logic, it doesn't matter at all. They are equivalent. Saying A or B is the same as saying B or A. So in terms of the logic, no. In terms of C, C matters a little bit, and we'll see why in a second. All right, any other questions based off that? Whoops. All right, so sometimes that whole if statement is fairly ugly. Anyone agree with me that that's kind of ugly? So one way of making things more clear in programming, especially if you're just beginning, is to give things names. So instead of doing all that complicated if condition, if you notice yourself making giant brackets around everything, that probably means you should just give something a name. So when I described it to you, I said, well, I checked for an uppercase letter and then I checked for a lowercase letter. So. Remember, there is a data type called a Boolean, and that is what the relational operators give you. So I could actually create a Boolean that is called is uppercase letter. So then in this Boolean, well, I can do that check. So I can just write it here. So it's an uppercase letter if the character is greater or equal to uppercase A and less than or equal to lowercase Z. And that makes it a bit more clear what I actually mean and what I'm checking. So now, well, if like a month later you came back to this code and you looked at it, you'd be, you might be like, well, what the hell are you doing? I don't even understand what you're trying to check for here. It looks a bit weird. So instead, like I said, we just give things a name. So now to check for a lowercase character, well, I just do the same thing, but except I use a lowercase character. And now my if statement would look a lot clearer because now I just type if is an uppercase letter or, or a lowercase letter, do the same thing. So now logically the programs are exactly the same, but does everyone agree this is probably a bit more readable and you can actually understand what it's doing here? So in this case, you should aim to write programs that are actually meaningful to you that you can even have a hope of reading later. So I would suggest trying to name stuff as soon as you get if conditions that are really, really complicated. Just give it a name and say in English, to, you, because we can name variables whatever we want, try and give it an English description of what you're actually doing. Oops. All right, so here on the slides, here is the code, so you have it. 
And here is our version that is a lot more readable because we just made names and actually described what our conditions were actually checking. So this is where the order actually kind of matters. So the C compiler will do some fairly smart things. So if I write something that's like a complicated condition or another complicated condition, so in the case that this first complicated condition evaluates to true, then C is just like, well, yeah, well, I'm not even going to bother to compute the other side because true or anything is true. So I don't even, it doesn't matter what the value is. So why would I even compute it? So in that case, it would not evaluate this complex condition too. And evaluate is just another word for C computing that condition or your computer actually like computing the final value. So in the case I had before, if the character was an uppercase character and that was true, well, it wouldn't bother checking if it was a lowercase character because it doesn't matter at that point. It's a letter and it can't be both at the same time, so why even bother? So that's the rules for a or statement because, well, it, the rule for an or is if either the conditions are true, then the entire thing is true. So if the left-hand side is true, doesn't matter what the value of the right-hand side is. So there is a similar optimization for the uh, AND logic operator. So remember with AND, both of the conditions have to be true for the final result to be true. Or in other words, if at least one of them is false, then the entire thing is false. So if I write some complicated condition and another complicated condition, and this complicated condition is false, well, I already know ahead of time they both can't be true. So the only way the whole result is true is if both of them are true. So if one is already false, that means the entire thing is going to be false. So if we evaluate complex condition one and it is false, we just skip evaluating complex condition two and this not having to compute it because the value doesn't matter. Well, the name we give it is say C has lazy evaluation, which means it's not going to compute anything that doesn't matter anyways. So if it doesn't matter, C will not just waste time actually computing it. So any questions about that? So the order, Logically, it's not going to matter, but in this case, if you have and, like A and B, if it's more likely than one is going to be false, you probably want that one first, but doesn't really matter. All right, and there was that. All right, so sometimes it is useful to rewrite these logic statements. And there are something called the Morgan's Laws that if you've done, you know, disc discrete electronics yet, maybe you haven't, maybe you have, uh, you might have seen these laws before. So they're just basically some logic laws. So the laws state that not A or B, well, that is exactly the same as saying not A and not B. So how does that make sense? Well, in this case, the only time that this will uh, be false is if they're both false. So in this case, I can kind of take this not, which just flips a value, and uh, kind of commute it in here, and I can change the A to be not A, and the B to be not B, and then I just change the connective logic gate from an or to an and. So these things are exactly equivalent. And I also have the version, if inside here is an and, then I can go ahead, bring in the not, and then I'll change the symbol over to a or. So in this case, 
The only way this is going to be false is if either of the values are false. So it's equivalent to saying it's either not A or not A is false or not B. They mean the same thing. So if I want to check that a character is not a letter, well, generally you want to kind of not have brackets everywhere to make it a lot easier to read. So instead of saying not an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter, I could use De Morgan's law to change that into an equivalent statement that just gets rid of one of the parentheses. So the thing I could rewrite this as that is exactly equivalent is, well, I can just say if it's not a uppercase character and it's not a lowercase character. So they mean the exact same thing. And yeah, so there's not much memorization in the course, but you should actually kind of commit the Morgan's laws to memory. They might make the, if you have a complicated if expression, it might make it easier to understand if you just rewrite it. So when you use these laws, we have to be aware of the precedence rules and some bugs you might have or some issues with your programs might be you didn't exactly use the brackets to get exactly what you wanted. So if I just took this, so say I just said I meant not an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter and I decided to just remove a set of brackets, so I changed it to not uppercase letter or lowercase letter, are these two things equivalent? So these two things are not going to be equivalent because remember the unary operator, so like not, that flips a value, well, it is a higher precedence than anything else. So what this will do is just flip the value of not an uppercase character. So this expression will be true if you do not have an uppercase character or you don't have a lowercase character instead of not having either or, right? So these two expressions are absolutely not equivalent and you might get into problems if you just start removing brackets willy-nilly. So the second example, if I reintroduce the brackets to it, I would see that, well, the not comes first, so it would be like not uppercase letter, and that would be done first, and then it would or it with or lowercase letter. So don't really have to know the precedence rules, just remember that unary operators have the highest precedence over pretty much any other binary operator but assignments, and you should never use assignments and expressions anyways. All right. Another fun thing to be aware of is that a semicolon by itself is actually a statement. <laughs> so remember the syntax for a if statement is just like if expression, then a statement. Well, if I write something silly like this, I might write if, you know, uppercase letter or lowercase letter, and then the really subtle thing I have is I just have a semicolon right here. So if I have a semicolon right there, that is the statement that will run if that expression is true. So if that expression is true, well, my computer will execute this empty statement that does nothing, and then this print f, or if this whole expression is false, it will skip over that semicolon and run this printf. So in either case, if I just accidentally put a semicolon there, I'll always get the result. You entered a letter printed off, which I would not expect and would likely be wrong because it's not likely you're always going to enter a letter. So just remember, do not use a semicolon there. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, are we going to get the, this, does this compile type questions on the exam? And hopefully not, because, well, then you could compile it. But in this case, this does compile fine. It just doesn't work. Yeah, well, I mean, like, yeah, it goes to, like, like analyzing, like, a chunk of code, saying, like, hey, does this do what, like, this is intended, I guess. 
Uh, possibly so. You can look at the past exams. I don't think they did exactly that, but yeah. Yeah, so if I actually wrote this, doesn't give me an error, doesn't give me anything. It just kind of runs weirdly. So, no matter what, it would always print the, it, uh, the, it would always do this print F and it would be weird. So I should just, don't write a semicolon here. Weird things will happen. So, like I said before, the print F always executes every single time. Just be really, really, really careful about it. If you write if and then parentheses, do not put a semicolon. So that's also the reason why I said just no matter what, after that parentheses for the if, just do a curly bracket. So do a curly bracket and you will not be disappointed. You will not kind of shoot yourself in the foot. All right, other things we can do. We can chain if statements together. So what I can do is I can write something like if a and then inside of the curly brackets after the a, well, that code and those statements will run only if a is true. And then instead of just an else, I can put an else if, so I can actually check another condition. So in this case, if a is false, so it would not, on, it would not run these lines, it would go over to the else and then check the condition for B. And then if B is true, then it will run this code. So this code I'm currently hovered over will only run in the event that A is false and then B is true. If B is also false, then it will just skip right to the end there. And sometimes this is useful and we'll get an example of that at the very end. But any questions about that? Yep. Yeah, so in this case, I could still throw an else at the very end if I wanted to and end it with an else. So I could always have some code run if all of the conditions are false. So here is the flow of that program. So it, we would always start from the top it would run whatever code is wherever that start comment is, and then it would check the condition for A. If A is true, it will run the code within the A's curly brackets, and then it would skip right to the end in the event that A is true. If A is false, well, then it goes into the elf is side, checks the value of B. If B is true, it will run the code uh, it will run the code here after B's curly brackets and that will run only in the event that A is false and B is true. And then after it's done running that, it would skip to the end. And in the event that B is false, it would skip right to the end. And like the comment said, if we wanted to, we could write an else at the end so that if A is false and B is false, then it always runs some code here before going to the end and joining up with the other ones. Other things we can do is we could nest if statements together. So we could write if A, and then within the curly brackets of A, we could write if B, and then have some statements in there. So what that will do is if A is true, then we will go into the code that will check if B and then if B is true, we will run these statements. So each time you begin a nested if, that adds another level of indentation. So you should shove your code over four spaces just to make it more easier to read. So generally, if you write something like this, so if you write if A and then directly inside of it, you write if B, well, these statements will only run in the event that A and B are true. So whenever you program, you want to have as little lines of indentation as you can get away with. So in general, you don't like nesting unless you absolutely have to. So if I wanted to write the equivalent thing without having two if statements, well, 
we should actually just use our logic statement. So th these statements only ran if A and B are true. So instead of that, I should actually just write, well, if A and B, and then run the statements. So like I said, in general, the less l nesting you have, the easier it is to read, and the better your life will be. So let us do our exercise of the day and we will write a program that actually finds the maximum of three integers. So we're going to have our user just input three numbers. We're going to cleverly call them X, Y, and Z. So in our scanf, we'll have, you know, three integers, so percent %d, percent %d, percent %d, and we'll put them in the variables x, y, and z, so they will go in that order. So our job is to do something here and actually assign the value to max, which uh, as the larger of whatever the variables are. So say I enter So if I enter three, two, and one, well, the largest number out of all those is three. So at the end, I should print off a three. In this case, well, I didn't initialize max and I just printed it out. So it should just have some old garbage value. So it likely won't be any of these. So if I do that, hey, I get 43,000. So again, Looks weird, that's why I said initialize your variables. So, in this case, right, my maximum could be x, or it could be y, or it could be z. So I have to write some logic to figure out which one it is. So generally, when you do this, we can write out our options. So. At the end, what our options are, well, we either want max to be equal to x, max to be equal to y, or max to be equal to z. And we want only one of those to run. So that means, well, we need an if statement for that because, well, we don't want all three of them to run. We only want a single one to run. So in this case, it's generally easier to reason about it on a case-by-case -case basis. So first, I might want to figure out the conditions that I want to assign the max value to x. So if I'm going to assign the max value to x, that means x should be bigger than everything else. So one of the things x should be bigger than is, let's say, x should definitely be greater than or equal to y. So in that case, we know that y is one of the biggest values. Well, what's another case? So that's not sufficient. So right here, I know that my biggest number is going to be x or z in this case, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. So for now, I'm just writing code as it comes to me and we can clean it up a bit later. So if I'm here, well, I know that X is at least as big as Y. So my maximum number is either X or Z. So I can try to distinguish between those two cases. So if X is greater or equal to Z, Ugh. So, in this case, which would be the largest number? X or Z? Votes for X. This smattering votes for Z. Votes for completely asleep. Yeah, all right. So, in this case, well, if I'm here, I know x is bigger than y, and if I make it into this if statement, I know x is bigger than y, 
and x is bigger than z or equal to it. So in this case, my max is going to be x. And then here I can write, I should consider, well, what happens if that is not true? Well, I know that x is at least as big as y, so if x isn't also at least as big as z, that means the maximum number is going to be z. So that's one case where the maximum value is equal either x or possibly z. So we can think of another case. So here I should write an else if because, well, I actually want this code to run only in the case that I haven't run the other one yet and I still need to check for other things. So I might want to check that, well, I want to check if y is my greatest value. So I want to think about the cases where I want to assign the max equal to y. So I can check, well, is y greater or equal to x? So now if y is greater to or equal to x, well, then I know my maximum value is equal either a y or a z. So I could do the same type of thing where I could check, hey, is y greater or equal to z as well? And if y is also greater or equal to z, well then my maximum value is y. And then in the case that that is false, I could write an else here and say that the max is equal to z. Okay, well now we have to consider the last case here. So if this is false and this is false, well, I don't have to really check anything else because I know x can't be the largest number and I know y can't be the largest number. So by process of elimination, I should just write else max equals z. So in this case, I know z is the maximum number. So that should cover all my cases. So now e either this is true and I either assign max to x or z or this is true and then I assign max equals to y or z or otherwise I know for sure that the maximum value is whatever I wrote in z. So now if I compile this and run it and I type again my 3, 2, 1, well in this case x, which is the first letter because order matters, should be bigger than everything else. So I'll get maximum 3 and that's because if we follow what our program did, well x was 3, so 3 was greater or equal to y, and 3 was also greater or equal to 1, so just this happened. So if this line happens, then nothing else would execute until we get to the printf line. All right, any questions about this program? Yep. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. All right, yep. Yeah, so the question is, is the last else statement necessary? So if I just got rid of this? So if I got rid of this, well, in this case, I might never actually assign anything to, uh, to max. So if I write the numbers in this case, let's say I do one, two, and three. Uh, that works, sorry, I do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, so in this case, we don't actually really need the else unless there's something I'm forgetting. But I could, in order to be safe, instead of writing that else, I could just initialize max equal to z at the beginning. And then I don't, also don't have to, I really don't have to write that else. All right, can we clean this up any more to make it a bit more readable? Because, well, can I get rid of that nesting of if statements? Yep. You can use ampersand like in the first one, x greater than equal to y, and x greater than equal to z. 
Yeah, so in this case, if I set max equal to z, well, I don't need this else because the maximum is already z, so I don't need to just reassign max from z to z. So I can just get rid of this and also get rid of this. And now if I have this code, well, it looks very similar to my nested, like, if A and then inside of that if B, I could instead write, well, if A and B. So this looks exactly the same, so I can actually just rewrite it. So I'll just move that condition out. So I'll say if x is greater or equal to y and also x is greater or equal to z, then I can just get rid of this because I know if both of those things are true, then the maximum value is equal to x. And then similarly for the other branch here, well, if y is greater or equal to x and y is greater or equal to z, then the maximum is equal to y. And in this case, my entire solution actually fits on a screen and it's a bit easier to, to read. So now if I compile and run this, it should be exactly equivalent of what I had for. I just got rid of my nested if. So if I run this, say one, three, two, well then my maximum in this case is just going to be three. So it seems to actually work in this case. Yep. No, because that's only false if both, if either one of them are false. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other quick questions? All right. Otherwise, I will be around here for a few more minutes and we can leave three minutes early. So just remember, phone for you. We're all in this together.